Today on Great Places Seen, we search for water and wildlife along rocky trails that reveal vistas and history. Come along for the ride and visit a scenic mountain lake. The leaves are down, flowers gone, the sun is out, and I'm not sure what I'll come across among the bare trees of Western Maryland. But it's a good excuse to take a beautiful late fall drive, and I'm on the way. That's perhaps one of the most unusual signs I've seen for a road crossing. This Maryland State Park is one of a handful that remains open year-round. A bit amazing considering Garrett County seems to get heavier winter weather than parts of neighboring West Virginia. But this November weekend is mild and, dare I say, warm. I have a campground host site, available because it's off-season. It's a full hookup site, which I need to get the trailer ready for winter, at least to the point where all I have to do is add pink antifreeze in the water lines. The long-range forecast is above freezing, so I'll keep my camping options open for now. At least the site is super level. All I have to do is back in, unhitch, and plug in. This is the Meshach Browning Loop, named after Maryland's early American frontier legend. Like Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett, Meshach Browning had grisly close-up encounters with bears, deer, panthers, rattlesnakes, wildcats, and wolves he hunted in the hardwood ridges of the Appalachian Plateaus. Browning was 78 when he died in 1859, but with almost no formal education, he spent his final years writing his life story that remains in print today. Meshach Browning's trusty rifle is on display at the Smithsonian Institution. Well, I paid for a full hookup site, however. Yep, nothing's coming out. Now the neighboring host site, which I wanted to rent but couldn't because it was taken, has water. So I'm going to fill up my collapsible five gallon water carrier and uh, put water in my holding tank. And we're siphoning the water from the tank.
I'm going to start today by getting some more water. Having a uh, collapsible five gallon container comes in handy quite often. And that with a siphon hose, you can pretty much get water almost from any source and put it into your tanks. Something good to have along the way. There is water at the campground entrance, but hey, I'm already unhitched. Well, even apparently Site 3 has water. Yeah, I'm not out here to watch TV, but uh, I do put a, an antenna up just to see what channels are around and to uh, take a look at the local stations. Bear box for food. We have a nice little deck at the host site. site just up the hill from the campground office. Let's check out the bathhouse. Typical of Maryland parks. It has what you need. Fix your bike here. Time to take a hike. Look, a bird's nest. So the trek begins. I've seen a lot of people head out on the trail already today. Uh, a lot of families and uh, even a few uh, trail runners. Obviously a lot of leaves have fallen and uh, they're a little bit slick. So in some places, especially where they're hiding rocks, uh, the footing is a little bit uh, tenuous, but overall not too bad. This first trail is called the Indian Turnip Trail. Well, they say the uh, Indian Turnip Trail along these orange blazes is uh, rocky with an elevation gain of about 600 feet before it levels out at the top of a ridge and then descends again. They say in the spring you can see a lot of uh, Jack in the Pulpit, also known as Indian Turnip. So that's uh, name obviously for the trail. This is roughly a four and a half mile trail loop. Well the signage is uh, quite good along these trails and we're gonna head on up to the lookout trail and apparently it's quite close. It's uh, less than a mile to the lookout trail. Looks like I'm leaving the uh, safety zone here and getting into the managed hunting area. Some rocks and tree roots through here, but uh, nothing terrible. Even though the leaves tend to uh, obscure what's under them. Uh, it's been a good trail so far.
always nice to know that you're in the safety zone. The nice thing about hiking a trail at this time of year is that the temperatures are moderate. It really is not cold out here and when you're moving and walking, you warm up pretty fast. And also, no insects. Don't have to worry about those. Don't really have to worry about any snakes. And really, not even any black bears. Most black bears are just not that active uh, at this time of year. The ranger told me that it's been several weeks since they sighted one. And black bears, as a rule, Generally, don't bother people, uh, especially as long as you make your presence known and uh, use the typical precautions. Don't run from a bear and uh, carry bear spray if they do come close to you. But for the most part, black bears will leave you alone. I can see uh, looking up there, that looks like to be the top of this little ridge and that's probably where the lookout trail is going to be uh, not too much further to it though the nice thing that i really like about this time of year too is with the leaves down my sight lines are not that obscured i can see the uh, topography of the land around me pretty clearly uh, obviously when the leaves are out a lot of this view is blocked and this is nice because you get a sense of uh, where you're at, what's around you. You can see that's a real steep grade over there. I see a little bit of uh, blue sky behind me, so hopefully the clouds will be clearing as the weather forecast predicts and we get some sunshine out here for some nice views. Now well, it looks like we're coming up to the Overlook Trail. Let's see what it overlooks. Light ascent here on the lookout trail. Uh, my guide here says that it is about a mile and a half long, a moderate trail. It says it's built to challenge even the most skilled mountain bikers. Also claims that the lookout trail uh, is good for a moderate hike. Follow the blue blazes for this one. Rugged yet short, this route includes rocky and steep terrain. And it says that the visitors must use Beckman's or the Indian Turnip Trail to access it. Well, we're certainly going to. Uh, get to Beckman's Trail because there's a point of interest there that we want to see. That ball is a gall, common in this forest, said to be most often caused by insects and some viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Not too far up and uh, already we can see the uh, Indian Turnip Trail that we came to uh, access the lookout trail. I can see a group of hikers down there on the uh, Indian Turnip Trail. To give you a sense, yeah, they're way down there. And this would be quite interesting to ride your bike through uh, these rocks and slippery leaves. Going up. Now, actually, they're on the same lookout trail that I'm on, so I think I need to move ahead a little bit so that 
I stay in front of them. It looks like we're starting to get a little bit of sunshine as promised. I'm starting to gain enough elevation here where I can see uh, ridge lines off in the distance. Uh, coming up on a uh, another switchback. Well, judging by the leads on this trail, they are not as packed down as they were, say, on the uh, Indian Turnip Trail, which means fewer people have been along this way recently. I'm not a mountain biker, but that's a pretty steep drop off if you uh, happen to take a tumble. And look here, here's the remnants of an old uh, tree with the leaves barely visible in this little pit that used to be uh, where the tree trunk stood. Wow, you hit that or some of these rocks, you might not have a nice day. I'm uh, gaining enough elevation now to begin to see part of Deep Creek Lake. Well, those folks are still making some uh, progress behind me. but they're still a good bit behind me. Well, there through the trees is a uh, facility for a tower. Sure enough, cell phone tower. I wonder if I have service here. And this goes all the way down to the park entrance. It could just go that way, though it's really steep. A fire tower up here, but uh, the trail information says no access to it. A sign at the trailhead said this is one of 34 Maryland fire towers in use in 1944. They remain as a monument to Maryland's early fire prevention program started in 1910. Another tree gall. Did you know ink from oak galls was used for centuries in documents such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, Leonardo da Vinci's notes, Van Gogh sketches, and the U.S. Declaration of Independence? That almost looks like Cookie Monster, doesn't it? And it uh, looks like we're coming up on a small lookout platform. You can imagine uh, that large group behind me uh, trying to take turns on this thing.
Outlook Trail is much flatter because, well, I'm at the top of the ridge, but I'm not quite sure where the Outlook is. Let's see what the sign says. I guess that was the scenic overlook. If the leaves are out, you really wouldn't see much scenery there. This is the Meadow Mountain Trail over here, which is not what I'm looking for. So I need to go back on the Overlook Trail. At least it's short. And coming back to the Overlook, my little detour allowed that big group of people to uh, come through. They are on their way down the rest of the trail ahead of me now. And the sun is coming out. Look at that. Very nice up here. Okay, well, starting the uh, descent now on the lookout trail. It appears, at least for the moment, that uh, this way is a little bit easier going down, but I haven't seen the rest of the trail yet. We'll find out. Got a little switch back. Another little obstacle course here. We'll go down there. Here we have the juncture of a couple trails. We're still on the lookout trail. We can rejoin the Indian Turnip Trail that way, or we can head down this way toward the Bartman's Trail, which is the uh, next destination on this little trek. Pretty close, quarter of a mile away. The signage here is impressively good. And here we go. My apologies to anybody named Bartman. It's Beckman's Trail. Well, we initially followed orange, then blue. Now we're following red. Not that long ago, I was above the uh, ridge you can see through the trees. And already, I've dropped down quite a bit from there. Maybe not even equivalent of halfway up that ridge at this point. Now through these trees comes another trail juncture. Let's see if this is what I'm looking for. Now we're still going to go up Beckman's Trail. It looks like it widens out quite a bit here. Almost looks like uh, service vehicles can get through this part. My error. The trail actually continues off to the side. So no wide, easy expanse there. Although it shouldn't be too bad to the part that I'm coming up on. I went past this little trail up here. It's not marked, but this is what I was looking for. So I had to backtrack to here, and uh, this is an interesting location. Going along this uh, rather steep but unmarked trail is the site of an old coal mine. 
In 1923, Delphia Brandt and George Beckman opened a mine here to excavate coal for heating local homes. Mining coal was extremely strenuous and taxing work by hand for only two men, and they both died after just a few years of work. See, the uh, tracks are still in place here. The abandoned mine eventually collapsed on its own. Later, the Maryland Forest, Park and Wildlife Service reconstructed the Brant Mine entrance to illustrate the difficult lifestyle of coal miners on Meadow Mountain during the 1920s. Inside the shack are still remnants of a time gone by, an old wood stove. It's a small mine, one of many such ventures in the area. Remnants, perhaps? Pretty interesting uh, piece of local history and uh, just down the trail is the homestead for the miners. I saw chipmunks all day scurrying through the leaves. They were impossible to catch on camera I was home before I saw this little guy on a short video clip. Today, only a sign marks the area of the Brant Mine homestead, completely reclaimed by nature a century later, perhaps helped by others salvaging wood. I have now diverted onto the Meadows Trail, White Blaze, and this is a pretty easy trail. It will take me to the top of the campground, but then I can drop back into and uh, short walk down to the trailer. And you can see the lake through the trees. Meshach Browning might have liked to have had this in his day. That's how you trap a bear. This is a nice little shelter with a fireplace. 
And finally back to one of the upper loops of the campground. Looks to be all primitive camping up here. And it is completely vacant at the moment. This is a very large area back here. It kind of gives you the sense that in season, this is a heavily used park. You might be able to see through the trees up there, the ridge line. That's where I was just a little while ago, way up there. And finally beginning to see some campers now. Look what I found. I might have just enough time to see the sunset at the boat ramp. It's simply beautiful. Deep Creek Lake wasn't always here. It's the largest man-made lake in Maryland, resulting from a project begun in 1922 by the Yokogany Hydroelectric Corporation. Completed in 1925, Deep Creek Lake has 65 miles of shoreline and sits at 2,462 feet above sea level. The state bought the land under the lake in the year 2000 along with buffer zone land. Thanks to perspective, if I move fast enough, I may get to see the sunset again.
It's moving day, and look, I was able to gently pry the water handle enough to get water. With the trailer tanks flushed and drained and the bathroom thoroughly cleaned, it's time to roll. Thanks for watching, and be sure to follow GPS to the next destination.